Today we're going to be doing a video called Where Did the Idea of the Trinity Come From? Uh, Mimesis and Poetry. Um, if you haven't watched uh, a lot of my other Mimesis videos, uh, I might suggest that you watch some of those first. This one here goes a little deep, um, but it is absolutely fascinating once you actually can see this. And I, I tell everybody um, all the time, if you want to know where these stories in the Gospels, these themes in the Gospels, mainly Gospels, Acts, and Revelation, because that's where you get your stories from. Uh, the Pauline epistles and the other letters, um, these are more instructions to churches of that age. But those six books I previously mentioned are usually where you get your stories from. And that these stories originated in the Greek world, usually uh, through the act of mimesis and poetry. Um, but we're going to discover today, uh, I, I always, again, I always tell my uh, uh, listeners, read the Homeric epics, uh, mainly Iliad and Odyssey, uh, the two Homeric epics. I've read these now 10 times each, and I just keep reading them over and over and over because the more you read them and understand them and study them, you start to see this, this, uh, this, this line that goes from the ancient Greek world, these stories to the Gospels. And, and in every case, uh, we see that the act of mimesis and poetry is used off of these uh, uh, older stories from the Greek writings. You know, also other uh, Greek writings like the Bacchae, uh, Euphigenia, Hesiod's uh, Theogony, Works and Days. You know, all these are important. But the Homeric epics is really the core of it, where they got these stories from. But we're going to get into the uh, where this idea of the Trinity came from and how the act of mimesis and poetry was used to develop this Trinity doctrine. First, we need to discover when did this Trinity, when was the first time Trinity was ever mentioned? Uh, because if you, if you look in your New Testament today, you won't find the word Trinity. It's not there. Uh, there are a couple interpolations uh, that are in your New Testament today that were, weren't, weren't part of the earlier writings. Uh, I don't have it on hand, but I believe it's in John um, that there are three uh, witnesses in heaven, um, you know, the, 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 the word. And I, I think I believe it's in John, but this is a known interpolation that um, what an interpolation is, is it's a later addition to the writings. Uh, all early manuscripts don't have this. That's because once the Trinity became a popular doctrine, they wanted to place it in the New Testament somewhere. So they added this writing in there. That's basically what an interpolation is. But who was the first historical person to mention or use the word Trinity? It was uh, Tortillian around the year 180 CE was the first one to mention the, the, word, uh, the, the word Trinity. And so around 180 is when he mentions this word for the first time in describing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, so put it in perspective, this is about a hundred years after the core part of the gospels were beginning to be written, about a hundred years after that. It's about 150 years after the time of the supposed crucifixion. So this is a later addition. And then under the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century, they 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 uh, uh made this part of the creed of understanding of Christian mythology, that this was a core doctrine now that is established in uh, in, in Christianity. But uh, that's just a historical aspect of it, where this, this word came from, when it was first used, and uh, a little bit of the timeline. However, if you read the Gospels, um, especially uh, in this case, the Gospels and, uh, and the book of Acts, you, you're not going to find the word Trinity, but you're going to find words such as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it's this is scattered throughout the Gospels and Acts. So just like the word rapture is not found in the New Testament, um, Paul uses a word, uh, two words called catching away. Uh, now, now that's beyond the scope of this video. It's a, that meant a whole different thing than what Christians today believe it means. But again, you know, we, we, they don't have that word in there. But when they read Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's what they're describing as a trinity. So even though the word's not there, this is a trinity in, in their eyes. And you do see this scattered uh, throughout Acts uh, uh, Acts in the four Gospels, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now that we've established that, what, what I want to do, this, 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 I, this 
this idea of the Trinity mainly comes from the book of the Odyssey, uh, one of the two uh, Homeric epics, okay? And before we get into this, I want to just briefly describe the Odyssey because if you don't know the, the story of the Odyssey, it's, it, it's none of this is going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, you're going to get a lot more out of it if you understand uh, the core text of the Odyssey. So what is the Odyssey? The Odyssey is, is a book that's taken place after the Trojan War. The Iliad describes a 10-year Trojan War. Actually, it only describes the final year of it, but it's, the Trojan War lasted 10 years. That's what the Iliad is about. So a man named Odysseus, who was king of Ithaca, had left, had left Ithaca to head towards Troy to battle in the Trojan War. He's gone for 10 years at this point, okay? Nobody knows, if, you know, know his family, his friends, his comrades. Nobody knows if he's alive or dead. After 10 years, they're supposing he's probably dead, all right? That's what the Iliad's about. It's about the Trojan War. The Odyssey picks up from the time the Trojan War is over to his 10-year return to get back to Ithaca. So he's gone for 20 years total. And right out of the beginning of the Odyssey, everybody believes Odysseus is dead and gone. Remember, there is no technology in those ancient times. So if a, if a person was gone 20 years and you know they went off the war, what would you think? He's probably dead. So his wife, Penelope, his son Telemachus, his uh, closest comrades, all believe he's dead and gone. It's been 20 years and he's not coming back, okay? So the beginning of the Odyssey is all about Telemachus, okay? Telemachus is the son of his father, Odysseus. Telemachus believes his father is probably dead, okay? Just like everybody else. But right off the bat, in the first couple books, Telemachus is told by Athena, the goddess Athena, to go to go around the world to try to find his father. Not necessarily to find his father, but to get information on what happened to him. You know, did he die at sea? Did he die in the war? What happened to him? So his son Telemachus goes off in search for uh, information on his father Odysseus. In book three and book four of the Odyssey, the son Telemachus goes and talks to Nestor, who is one of the wise men of Greek. Uh, he was one of the ancient warriors, but he one of the best communicators in, in Greek. And also to talk to Menelaus, who was the king of Sparta, who was one of the uh, comrades of Odysseus during the, uh, the Trojan War. So he goes and talks to Nestor and Menelaus and to get you know any information he can on them. And they start looking at Telemachus because uh, it's been years. Uh, Telemachus was a baby before the war started. You know, now Telemachus is in his early 20s. So they're looking at Telemachus and, and, and they're both like, you know, you resemble your father. You and your father look identical. You look, you look the same. Uh, you know, it, it's as if you and your father are one. Okay. So through the next several books, through 4 through 15, as far as Telemachus goes, He's in search for his father, <coughs> and uh, he's having really no luck uh, finding his father. He goes to many others trying to get information on, on him and, and, and so forth. But finally, in book 16, this is a big book in the Odyssey. In book 16, uh, actually just shortly before this, but in book 16, Telemachus, who's out on his journey looking for his father, is told by the goddess Athena to go back home. To, to go back to Ithaca, his mother Penelope is worried sick about him, to go back home. So Telemachus basically pulls the plug on this and, you know, goes back home, uh, back to Ithaca. When he gets there, though, short time after, Odysseus has now returned to Ithaca, but nobody knows who he is. He's dressed up like a poor uh, servant. Uh, he, he's completely in rainy clothing. He, he doesn't, nobody recognizes him. And in book 16, Odysseus, the father, tells his son Telemachus that it is truly him, that that it is it is I, your father. And Telemachus broke into tears of joy and was just absolutely uh, uh, thrilled about this. Uh, just a specific verse in Odyssey 16 says, Odysseus reveals himself to his only son Telemachus. Odysseus tells his son not to tell anyone who he is. This was important in book 16. So the father Odysseus tells his son Telemachus that it, that is I. I am your father. I have returned. Understand, 
number one, nobody knows that the father, Odysseus, has returned, except for the son, Telemachus. Nobody knows. Not only does nobody know, but the father, Odysseus, tells his son, do not tell anybody that I have come back. Why? Why not tell anybody? Well, the reason for this was because Odysseus was uh, planning, when he returned to Ithaca as a poor servant for several books, or book 16 through 21, he plays as a poor servant. He's kind of in disguise. Nobody knows who he is. This is all an attempt to gain information on who is with him and who is against him. Majority of people were against him. They, they believed he was dead and gone, but they didn't want him to be king over them him anymore. Uh, so Odysseus wanted to find out if there's any loyal disciples that were willing to be on his side. You know, they, they, that will fight for, with him and instead of against him. But at the end of the day, near the end of the Odyssey, he was going to destroy the prideful, wicked suitors. OK, so that was why he told his son Telemachus not to tell anybody because it wasn't his hour yet. It wasn't his time to reveal who he truly was yet. Much like Jesus was a poor servant. Uh, you know, he wasn't looked upon like a king, even though he was a former king. OK, he was a king of the Jews. Just like Odysseus was king of Ithaca before, but nobody recognizes him. <laughs> they're both spit upon, they're both reviled, they're both mocked, and and but Odysseus and Jesus both kept their cool this whole time. They never struck back, they never reviled back, they endured all of this. And Jesus will destroy his enemies when he, he comes back, a second coming. Just like Odysseus, when he strips off the servant outfit and comes back a second time, he will destroy his enemies. Jesus uh, uh, spent three days in the in the tomb before revealing he was alive, just like Odysseus was in the shelter of uh, Eumaeus the swineherd for three days. And after this, he announced he was alive in Ithaca when everyone believed he was dead. But I don't want to get too far off topic here, but book 16 to 21 is all about Odysseus being a poor servant. He tells Telemachus who he is, his son. But he tells him not to tell anybody else who he is until his hour has come. That's very important to understand. Let's take a look at Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 to see if we can kind of catch up a little bit here. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, the Father. Okay, plus look at John 14, 8 and 9. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Okay, it's very important to understand that. So <clears throat> nobody knows the Father except the Son, according to Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus is saying here, nobody knows the Father, okay, except the Son. Just as in Odyssey 16, nobody knew who the Father was except the Son. Now, one may say, well, but Jesus is the Son of God. He's not Father. That doesn't make any sense. Or is he? John 14, 8 and 14, 9, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Back in the Odyssey, Telemachus, the son, is told not to tell anybody, okay? That he is to keep this a secret until the hour, the, the hours come. But Telemachus only is the, is the son. He's the only one that knows the Father, Nobody else in the world knows the father except the son. Because Odysseus, the father, is dressed up like a poor servant. He's in disguise. Nobody recognizes him. Only the son knows who he is. Just like Jesus, the son, is the only one that know who the father is in the Gospels. This is, the, this is poetry here. This is where, this is poetic. It was a poetic world. That's why they're called the Greek poets. All right, let's go on here. <clears throat> Because it gets a little bit better here in just a second. Take a look at Odyssey 17 through 21. <clears throat> Again, nobody knows who the Father is except the Son. And nobody knows who the Son is, his immediate actions, that is, except the Father. Through these few books, he reveals who the Father is to a handful of disciples. Okay, let's stop right there just for a second. So, in seven, book 17 through 21 of the Odyssey, remember, book 16, the son Telemachus is the only one to know who the father is. And he's not supposed to tell anybody who the father is. 
What did Jesus say? Nobody knows who the Father is except for who the Son reveals him to be. All right? That's going to be very, very important in a minute. Because the Odyssey 17 through 21, what happens? The Son reveals to a handful of disciples who the Father is. That is truly Odysseus, the Father. Only a handful of disciples. So it's who he reveals his Father to are the only ones that know who the Father is now. Just as Jesus says the same thing, only the Son knows the Father and who he reveals him to. And it was a handful of disciples that Jesus revealed who the Father was. Just as in the Odyssey, 17-21, the Son reveals to only a select few who the Father is. <laughs> Unbelievable. Take a look at Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. This to confirm this. It says, to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, the Father too. That is, to a few disciples. So again, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus, the Son, is the only one to know who the Father is. Okay? But he chooses only to reveal, he, he chooses who he reveals the Father to. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. Just like Telemachus in the Odyssey is the only one in book 16 to know who the father is. The son, Telemachus, is the only one to know who the father is, Odysseus. But in book 17 through 21, the son, Telemachus, reveals to a few select disciples who the father, Odysseus, is. Just as Jesus reveals to a few disciples who the father is. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. <clears throat> Let's go to the final book of the Odyssey. Odyssey 24. And is it, this is going to tie up like a bow here in just a second. Odyssey 24, Odysseus reveals who he is to the last follower by showing him a scar that proves who he is. The follower doubts and doesn't believe it is truly Odysseus until he sees a scar and touches and handles him to make sure, and this proof shows that this is truly Odysseus. And the last follower faints out of joy. Once his last follower comes to the knowledge that this is truly Odysseus, who has seemingly come back from the dead, Odysseus knows that everyone on the outside are going to have a hard time believing without seeing. So let's stop right there here in Odyssey 24, the final book. Okay. Odyssey 16, as of course what we mentioned, is when Odysseus, a father, reveals to his son, Telemachus, who he is. Telemachus is told not to tell anybody. Okay. But in book 17 through 21, the son reveals to a handful of disciples who the father is. Why everybody else doesn't know who the father is. Just as Jesus says, the Son chooses who he reveals the Father to, a handful of disciples. But the ones on the outside don't know who the Father is. <laughs> okay? So now we get to, to, to uh, and right after that, by the way, in book 22 and 23 is when Odysseus, his second advent, he's come back, he's revealed himself to be alive when he was previously thought to be dead, and he destroys the prideful men. Just as Jesus was dead, comes back, a second coming, and destroys the wicked, uh, uh, prideful people that rejected him. Both Jesus and Odysseus are former kings. Odysseus was a king of uh, Ithaca, where the people did not want him to be king over them anymore, so they slayed them, okay? They, uh, uh, Odysseus had them slayed in front of him. Just like the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gives a story about a king that the people didn't want him, uh, that king to be king over them anymore. So Jesus, as a king, has him slayed in front of him. So Jesus destroys his enemies, the wicked, prideful people, enemies of his church. Odysseus destroys the wicked, prideful people, the enemy of his estate. Same exact thing. But here in Odyssey 24, <coughs> Odysseus has now announced he's back and alive, seemingly coming back from the dead, because everyone believed he was dead, except for one man, Laertus. Laertus was the final follower to come to the knowledge that Odysseus has returned seemingly from the dead. And when Odysseus told him who he was, Laertus did not believe him. He doubted. He's like, you know, he put his arms up and he's like, if you really are Odysseus, then you will give me such proof. Odyssey 24. And Odysseus said, observe this, my scar. And Odysseus is touched and handled and observed, and Laertes ends up fainting out of joy. He is in shock, he's in joy. <clears throat> okay. 
And a big part of this too is Odysseus realizes that Laertes believes because he sees. But the ones on the outside that hadn't seen, that they, they don't know Odysseus has seemingly come back from the dead yet. They're going to have a hard time believing that Odysseus is back because they haven't seen. Just as Jesus with Thomas. We'll get into that here in just a second. Let me uh, let me read the uh, verse from John 20, 27 to 31. This is when Jesus has revealed himself to all his disciples. They all know he's come back from the dead. Except for the final disciple or follower, Thomas. He's the only one that doesn't know that Jesus has come back from the dead yet. Or doesn't believe it. He doubts. Okay, John 20, 27 to 31. Then Jesus said to Thomas, the last follower, to find out, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it into my side and stop doubting and believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. After this conversation, Jesus says, You believe because you see. The ones that don't see are going to have a hard time believing. So, just as Odysseus with Laertes. Laertes was a final follower to come to the knowledge that Odysseus was seemingly back from the dead. And, uh, and Laertes didn't believe him. He doubted. So Odysseus showed him a scar and was touched and handled, just like Thomas was the final disciple to come to the knowledge that Jesus had come back from the dead. And Jesus proves that it's him by showing him a scar, and he's touched and handled. Both Laertes and, uh, and uh, Thomas basically are in joy and almost faint. Thomas is like, my Lord and my God. I mean, he's in shock and he's in joy. Just like Laertes is in shock and joy. And in both cases, once this final disciple, Amel, discovers the information that, 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 that the, the, this hero, uh, their master, has come back from the dead, they understand that everyone else on the outside that hasn't seen this are going to have a hard time believing that it's truly Jesus or Odysseus that has come back. And again, we're going to tie this up uh, in a bow here in just a minute. Let's take a look, again, look at Odyssey 24. <laughs> the, the last couple paragraphs of the book, okay, is the very end of Odyssey 24. The fathers of the suitors whom were killed by Odysseus and Telemachus. So these are the fathers of the suitors. The suitors were the prideful religious leaders like that of the Pharisees in the Gospels. The suitors were slaughtered and slayed uh, by uh, the father Odysseus and the son Telemachus, okay? So Odysseus and Telemachus had left now after slaughtering them. But the fathers of the suitors that died now want to take their revenge and go after the father and son duo of Odysseus and, uh, and, and Telemachus. Okay. So they're attempting to go back to war with these two, Odysseus and, uh, and Telemachus. As a fight is set to begin, Zeus, father God. And understand, in the Greek world, anytime you said father God, it was referring to Zeus. Hundreds of times in the Greek writings and literature, Zeus is referenced as Father God many times. He is called Father God. That's who he is. He's a father of all gods. So Father God sends a goddess Athena to this, to this beginning of the war and tells him to call a truce and make peace. They do this and the story ends. So at the very end here, this is going to be very important in a minute. The fathers of the suitors that were slayed by father and son Odysseus and Telemachus. The fathers of these suitors now want to go at exact revenge on the Odysseus and Telemachus. So they get on their armor and they go after them, okay? And now and Odysseus and Telemachus are ready to fight. So this war is now about to restart again, right? But right at this moment, Father God Zeus commands peace to be given. And notice this all happens after the event. After the reign of Odysseus' terror of, of slaying his enemies, okay? All this happens after all of that. This is a very, very end of the story. And Zeus calls a truce. He calls peace. And they end up making a truce and they leave peacefully. No more war. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at John 14, 26 or 31. Jesus says, But the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. Peace I leave you with. My peace I give you unto you. 
just as the fathers of the suitors came to remembrance of the travesty that happened to their sons and the suitors. But then Zeus, the Holy Spirit of Father, sends peace to the people and a truce is made. So I want you to make sure you understand that. So Jesus says, not right now. You know, I, I've not come to bring peace. But the Holy Ghost, whom who? Whom the Father will send. The Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. Peace I leave you with. Peace I give on to you. So the Holy Ghost, Father, is going to bring peace. But the Holy Ghost only comes after Jesus has, it finishes his ministry, once this is all uh, uh, done and away with. Now you, now you correlate that with the uh, Odyssey story. Just as the fathers of the suitors, they came to remembrance. Once their sons had died, they came to remembrance of the travesty. Just as Jesus says, all, he brings all things to remembrance. So these suitors' fathers come to remembrance of the travesty that just happened to their sons, the suitors. But then Zeus, Father God, Holy Spirit, sends peace to the people and a truce is made. Just as Jesus will send, the Holy Ghost will be sent after Jesus goes away, after his ministry. The Father will send the Holy Spirit, who will bring what? Peace. Just as the story of the Odyssey ends with peace, the story in the Gospels will end with the Father sending the Holy Spirit, which will send peace. Uh, let's go one more step further this to make sure we prove this. But did you notice something strange? Jesus says in John 14, 26 through 31, that the Father will send peace, just as the Father Zeus in the Greek story of Odyssey sent peace afterwards. However, earlier on, Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Did you get that? Jesus in Matthew 10 says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Just as Odysseus and his son Telemachus did not bring peace, they brought a sword to slaughter their enemies. Just as Jesus says, I don't, I don't come to bring peace but a sword. And in another verse, Jesus says to go sell your cloak and buy a sword because these enemies of him are going to be slain. But, get, look, at the, uh, but look at the next step. Again, just as a son, Telemachus and Odysseus didn't come to bring peace as they killed everyone uh, that didn't want him to be uh, Odysseus to be king over them with a sword. But Zeus, the father of the Holy Ghost, did bring peace. And this was all, uh, when it, once it was all over, Zeus brought peace. Father God brought peace, the Holy Ghost, once this was all over. Just as a father brings peace via the Holy Ghost, with G once Jesus' ministry was all over. It's the same thing all the way through. So, you know, let's wrap this up here first before we uh, go to a little bit of a, uh, a recap or conclusion. So Telemachus in the Odyssey is the son, just as Jesus is the son in the Gospels. So Telemachus the son, Jesus, a son. Odysseus is the father in the gospel story. But Jesus not only plays as a son, but he also plays as the father as well. John 14, 8 and 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. The father and I are one. In the Odyssey story, Zeus plays as the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Just as <clears throat> the Holy Ghost in the Odyssey or in the uh, gospel story who came after Jesus. And that's important. Zeus really didn't have a whole lot to do with the 24 books of the Odyssey until he brought peace at the very end. Once all this was done, all the, all of it was over with. That's when Zeus made his appearance as, as demanding peace be brought. Just like the Holy Ghost is not part of any of the gospel stories. Until it's over with, until Jesus is gone, then the Holy Ghost comes and the Father sends, who brings peace all the way through. It's absolutely amazing. So this idea of the Trinity, yes, Tertullian is the first one to ever mention the Trinity. But this idea mainly stems from mimesis and poetry. It, 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 again, if you read the Odyssey, I, I, just, I, I plead with you to read both Iliad and Odyssey. But this specifically comes from the Odyssey. It's all about a story of the son Telemachus, his father Odysseus, and Zeus, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost, or father at the very end. 
in the first, again, first 15 books of the Odyssey, Telemachus is on the search for his father. He, 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 everyone believes he's dead. Okay, and it's finally in book 16 that the father Odysseus reveals to the son who he is. And the son is the only one to know who the father is, just as Jesus is the, the son is the only one to know who the father is. <clears throat> Odysseus, a father, tells his son not to tell anybody until it's his hour, just as Jesus is not going to show himself who he is until his, until his hours come. But Telemachus is told that he, he, he tells a few handful of disciples who the Father is. Just as Jesus says, the Son will reveal to who he wants to show who the Father is. It's absolutely amazing. And the, again, at the very end, this, this Father and Son, of course, Odysseus destroys all of his enemies, just as Father uh, uh, Jesus, 14, 8 and 49 John, destroys all his enemies. And remember, too, Jesus and, and Odysseus are both former kings. King of Ithaca with Odysseus and a king with Jesus. They are both rich. They, they came poor. Odysseus became a poor servant or beggar in disguise. Jesus became a poor beggar or servant in disguise. And this was to, to not reveal who he was. But there will be a come, come a time, Odysseus' second advent, where he destroys his enemies. Just like Jesus will come back in the second advent as a royal king and destroy his enemies. Same exact thing across the board. But this idea of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, was a poetic inspiration from the Odyssey. Of the, the Father Odysseus was a son Telemachus. It was a romantic story. Nobody knew who the Father was except his son Telemachus. But as, again, the son Telemachus revealed to a handful of disciples who the Father is. Just like the son revealed who the Father was to a handful of disciples in the Gospel story. Uh, and at the very end, there's no peace in the Odyssey. The very end, though, Father God sends down peace and ends it all. They, you know, it's a truce made. Just as in the Gospels, the Holy Ghost is not part of the Gospels. He doesn't come onto the scene until Jesus goes away. <clears throat> the Father sends the Holy Ghost to send peace. Because Jesus didn't send peace. He says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Just like Odysseus and his son Telemachus didn't come to bring peace. They brought a sword to slay their enemies. But the Father God, once all this was over, sent peace. Via the Holy Ghost in the Gospels, Zeus, uh, uh, via Zeus in the, uh, in the Odyssey. The peace was brought upon the people at the very end. So this trinity comes from Zeus, the Holy Ghost, Father Odysseus, son Telemachus. Oh, I'm sorry, I got all that wrong. Yes, Father Zeus... Played as the Holy Ghost, okay, or Father in uh, uh, in the Gospels. Jesus was his own Father in the Gospel story, John 48 49. Odysseus was a Father in the uh, Odyssey story. Jesus was the Son of the Father in the Gospel story, just like Telemachus was the Son of the Father in the Odyssey story. This is where the poetry of the Trinity came from, this romantic Greek story by the legendary uh, Greek poet uh, Homer. And in this time period, Homer was everywhere. I mean, he was the most beloved author to ever exist for the longest, longest time. And all this inspiration comes from him. All right, guys, hope you've enjoyed this video and now understand where this uh, idea of the Trinity came from, where it came through mimesis and poetry, like uh, like everything else in the Gospels, this romantic story of a, of a son finding his father and is the only one to know his father. Nobody else knows the father but the son because the father was hidden from everybody else. But finally, the father would be revealed by the son to a few uh, disciples, just as Jesus uh, would finally reveal who the father was to a few disciples. But in the end, peace would come upon everybody uh, via the Holy uh, Holy Ghost in the uh, uh, Acts story or Zeus sending his peace in the uh, Odyssey story. All right, guys, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you know where to reach me. Until next time, thank you very much.